a long time ago, I must have been like maybe 10 years old or so, somebody showed me an interesting math trick to do multiplication. Now, this is not the kind of trick that makes it like easier or faster, but it's kind of curious that it works. I'm going to use this example to show you how it works. We're going to multiply 29 times 1201. I'll tell you now the result is 34,829, so you can check that the result is correct at the end. So here's how the trick works. The first thing we do is we divide the first number, 29, by 2. So we have it. And we get 14.5, but we're just going to discard the decimals. In other words, we're rounding down. And then, of course, 14 divided by 2 gives you 7, and then we keep doing this. So this would be 3.5, rounded down as 3, and then 1. And then when we reach 1, we stop. Next, we take the number on the right, and we multiply it by 2. So we double it. So we get 2402, and then we get 4804, and then we get 9608, and finally we have 19216. The next step is to look at the left column and see which of these numbers are even. And it turns out there's only one, it's this one, and just eliminate it, so just get rid of it. And then finally, we add up all of the numbers on the right. And then one plus our carry gives us three. And ta-da, we get the right result. So our task today is to implement that in Funkyton. Let's see how we can do that. But wait a second, I hear you say. You said you need to multiply by two, but we're trying to write a multiplication function. How is that gonna work? Well, if you've paid attention to my earlier videos, then you probably already guessed that dividing by two, rounding down, is actually the same as doing shift right one, which we can do in Funkyton by doing shift left negative one. And multiplying by two is the same as shift left one. Okay, but there is one more thing we need to do, and that is we need to check if a number is even or not, in order to know which rows to discard. Well, since computers always operate in binary, let's take a look at some numbers in binary. So here are the numbers 1 through 8 in binary, and of course the even numbers are the 2, the 4, the 6, the 8. What do these numbers have in common that the others don't? Well, the answer is, it's the last bit. You will notice that all the even numbers have a zero bit at the end, and all the odd numbers have a one. So how do we check if a number is even or odd? Well, we need to look at the last bit of the number. Hey, we did that in the last video. We can do that using bitwise and with the number one. And that will mask out the last bit and will give us zero if it's zero or one if it's one. Let's see if we can turn that into an algorithm, a recursive algorithm, of course. So primarily what we want to do is we want to shift right a by 1, which I'm going to express as shift left negative 1. And we also want to shift left b by 1. And then we want to call the function recursively. So we're going to multiply those two things. And I'm going to call the result of that r. But of course, because it's recursive, we need to prevent it from being an infinite loop. So we need a terminating condition. And the terminating condition, of course, is if a is equal to zero. Because in that situation, we know what the result is. Multiplying zero by anything gives you zero, no matter what b is. Okay, but now we need to distinguish two cases, if a is even or if a is odd. Well, in both cases, the result is going to be r plus something. I'm just going to call it c now. Let's think about what that something is. Well, if a is even, then we want to discard this number. So actually, c is equal to zero. But if a is odd, then we need to add the current value of the second number, which is b. Now, this is the only place where I've used r, so I'm just quickly going to move that over here. Right, and finally, let's remind ourselves how we actually determine if a is even or odd. Well, remember that we're doing a bitwise and with 1, and if that is true, in other words, non-zero, then the last digit was a 1, which means it was odd. So that's when we want c equals b. And in all other cases, we want c equals 0. And now we're ready to implement this in Funkyton. So, as usual, we start with a question mark, because we need to check if a is already 0. 
If it is non-zero, then we need to apply that formula. And if it is zero, well, then the answer is zero. So we just put a zero box there. Now the formula has a plus at its top level. So we're going to add a plus box. And now let's remind ourselves what the C was. Well, in the case where A and one is true, that was B else zero. So we can express that with another question mark box. And remember here that the output of that question mark box is on the right, which means that this is the condition A and one. This is the case where that is non-zero. So in the case of odd numbers, and this is the case for even numbers. Next, let's put that multiplication there. And then we can immediately do the A shift left negative one. And we can join up the two wires that need A with a splitter. Now, as for the bitwise and, you remember how to do that. We do a bitwise nand followed by a bitwise not. So this is what it looks like. So we're anding A with one. And that actually places a one box in a very convenient place for us to do the shift left one. And now all of the wires just say A or B. So we need to join them all up. I'm going to join up the A's by punching that A wire through these. So I'm going to need the, the, the wire crossing function that we created last time. And then we can join up the A's. And then finally just join up the B's. And then we have some space right there to put our declaration box. And now we have a multiplication function. But there is a problem with this multiplication function. And maybe you've already guessed what it is. Remember when we were dividing by two every time, so we're just halving the number and then rounding down. Well, the problem, of course, is what if this first number here is negative? If you keep halving, you will eventually reach negative one. And then when you have negative one, you get negative one half, but then you round that down and you're back to negative one. So that will never reach zero. So it would be an infinite loop if we just let it run. But fortunately, there is an easy fix for that. We've basically done something like that in the addition function. So let's do the same thing here. In fact, it's even easier now because we have the unary minus function from last video. So all we need to do if the first number is negative is just negate it, which will make it positive. And then we can negate the result because negative a times b is the same as negative a times b. So we need a separate multiplication function that will apply our fix. So we can't have this function be called times. I'm going to rename it the same way as I did with the addition function by just adding a p for private. And then the function that applies the fix is just going to call that. So we start out with a question mark once again, because we want to check if a is non-negative. In other words, a is greater or equal to zero. If that is true, then the answer is the multiplication function that we already have. And if it is not true, well, then we're going to negate a, then do the multiplication and then negate the result. So let's check if a is non-negative by using this function. Now I'm using the less than or equal to function here because this is the output, which means that this is the first operand. So we're actually checking if zero is less than or equal to a, which is the same as a greater or equal to zero. Next, let's do the negation using the unary minus function that we've already written. Then we do the multiplication, but of course we need to call our private function from earlier. And then we can do the negation of a by applying the unary minus to that. Okay, now let's add the multiplication function on the other side. And again, we need the private function. And now we have a function that has only a's and b's on its wire. So we need to join them up. Now I'm going to join up the b's by taking this wire through here. So I'm going to add a wire crossing function in there so that I can then join up the b's into this splitter. And then we have all three of these A's, which we can also join up with a splitter. And now we have a big space in here for the declaration box to fit in. So this is the actual multiplication function. And the other one is kind of only a helper function. We don't really want any other code to call the private function. So let me quickly explain something that I actually forgot to mention in my last video, which is that Funkyton actually has a syntax element to declare a function as private. And this is what it looks like. It's this little hook here on the declaration box. So what does private mean? Well, what it means is that we can put both of these functions in one source file and then they can both access each other. 
but the private function can only be accessed by other functions within the same source file. So this call here is valid because it's in the same source file, but if you have another function or even the main program in some other source file, it will not be able to call this function directly, which is what we want. We never want to run the risk of an infinite loop. Now let's see if that multiplication function actually works. So let's write this simple program here, which does the multiplication we did earlier. I am multiplying 29 by 1201. And then as before, I call the function which turns the result, which is an integer, into a string for output. And remember the result that we expect was 34,829. And indeed that is what we get. But that's not the only way we can fix this, is it? All we need to make sure is that a, the first parameter, gets negated so that the helper function doesn't get a negative number and that the result is correct. Well, instead of negating the final result, we could also negate b. So let's go ahead and make that change to the function and see what difference it makes. So we're no longer negating the result of this multiplication, so I'm going to remove this and put a blank line instead. But instead, we want to negate the value that goes through this wire here. So I'm going to pull that wire down and then put a unary minus function there. And the result would look like this. So now if I run that example program from earlier, of course, we still get the same result. But we already knew that. We know that the function gives you the same result. What could make a difference is that one of the two variants could be faster than the other. And we won't be able to see the difference in this function because this is only multiplying positive numbers, but the difference is only applicable when we multiply negative numbers. So in order to test that, I wrote a program which will actually multiply all of the negative numbers from negative 1 to negative 47. So it's kind of like 47 factorial, but with all of the negative numbers. So the end result should be the negative of 47 factorial, but it will continually multiply negative numbers, so the difference should show. So here's what happens if we run that program with our first version of the multiplication function. So in my particular hardware, this takes about 2.2 seconds. I've run this multiple times, I keep getting more or less 2.2 seconds. But with the new multiplication function, let's take a look. Look at that, it takes only 2 seconds, so it's about 10% faster. There is actually another way that I thought of that the multiplication function could deal with negative numbers. Remember how I said that when you should write the negative number, you will always eventually reach negative 1 and then be stuck on negative 1? Well, we can modify this algorithm by just dealing with that by adding an additional condition here at the top. If a is equal to negative 1, well, the result will just be negative b, right? Because you're multiplying negative 1 by the other parameter, which is b. And so I went ahead and implemented that, and here it is for your viewing pleasure. But unfortunately, when I tested it, it turns out it's about 2.3 seconds, so it's still slower than the other alternative. Now, in my last video, I showed you this function, the increment function, and I argued that we needed it in order to fix the addition function, because the addition function sometimes creates an infinite loop. Now, somebody in the comments quite correctly pointed out that as long as you take care of the special case with negative 1, you can actually always use the naive addition function to add 1, and it will not create an infinite loop. Now, to their credit, this is actually something I hadn't considered, so kudos. But I did go ahead and test it, and it turns out that using the addition function to do the plus 1 is actually slightly slower than this increment function. So I'm going to keep the increment function for performance reasons. Okay, so we've established that that particular example works, but how can we be certain that this trick always works with every multiplication problem? Well, I'm going to show you two different ways of convincing yourself. The first one is based off of what we've learned in elementary school on how to do multiplication by hand. And the second one is a mathematical proof. Take your pick. So, do you remember how long multiplication worked? Well, I'm told that this is sometimes taught a little differently between countries and cultures, but I'm going to show you what I learned and you can probably see the similarities. So we want to multiply 29 by 1201. So we take the smaller number, in this case 29, and we write multiple copies of it underneath each other in this kind of staggered fashion, one for each digit of the other number. 
But of course we don't actually write the number 29 each time, but rather we multiply it with each of the digits that it is aligned under. So this one would be times 1, this one times 0, this one times 2, and this one times 1. Now obviously times 0, well, that gives you 0, so that number just disappears. We don't even write it. And of course times 1 doesn't make any change to the number, so it just stays at 29. And only the times 2 requires us to actually change the number, in this case to 58. And then the last step, of course, is to add these all up, and we get 34,829, which is what we expected. But of course, as always, computers actually operate in binary and not in decimal. So let's see if we can do the same thing, but in binary. So once again, we'll have to write this number as many times as there are digits in this number, which looks like this. And then we need to multiply each of these with each of the digits of our number starting with the least significant digit, which is this one. So we need to multiply this by 1. I think you've already guessed what happens now. The 1s make no change, but the zeros, well, we just get rid of them. And then we add up the result. I'm sure I don't need to show you how the addition works, because we've already done that in the previous video. But the point is that this whole times 0 times 1 is exactly what we did when we checked whether a number was even. So what we did is we shifted this number to the right one bit at a time and then checked if it's even in order to check each of its individual bits. And whenever we encountered a 1 bit, we basically add on this thing and then at the next 1 bit we add on this thing, etc, etc. But if you're a mathematical kind of person, let's see if we can find a mathematical proof that this formula is actually correct and actually gives us a times b. Well, there are some obvious transformations we can do here. For example, b shift left 1 is obviously just 2 times b. And then since that is a multiplication of a multiplication, we can just put the 2 times in front. Now, let's think about what a shift right 1 actually does. Well, remember that if the number is even, then we're shifting out a zero bit and the number just basically becomes halved. But if a is odd, which it is if a and 1 is true, then that 1 bit will actually be shifted out, which means that we'll end up with 1 less than a halved, and in all other cases it's just a halved. And now we can distribute that two times into each of these cases. So it will cancel out with this divide by 2 and with this divide by 2. Let's also distribute this times b. So this is actually a minus 1 times b and this is a times b. Okay, very good. Now let's distinguish those two cases. If a and 1 is true, well then this left parenthesis will be b and the right parenthesis will be that. And in the other case, where a and 1 is false, in other words, the number is even, then here we have a 0, and then here we have a times b. Finally, all we need to do is just multiply out this a minus 1 times b, and we end up with a times b minus b. And then the b plus and the minus b just cancel out. And of course, the 0 plus just does nothing. And now you can see that in every case we end up getting a times b. So in essence, in this video, I've shown you three different ways how you could derive the multiplication function. You can either try and apply what you learned in elementary school, in other words, long multiplication, or you can think about it in mathematical terms, rearranging equations. Or maybe you happen to know some kind of trick which happens to be useful. Well, now we've done addition, subtraction, and multiplication. You know exactly which arithmetic operation is still missing. That's right, division. So whichever of these three methods gets you there, my challenge to you is to write a division function, but I will give you a heads up now, since Funkyton only deals with integers, and indeed most programming languages have a division function that works with integers, which will always do a rounding down. My challenge for you is to write a division function on integers that will do rounding down. But the division function that I wrote not only does the division, but it actually returns the remainder, in other words the modulo, 
at the same time. So what we actually want is we want a function that takes two parameters, let's call them a and b, and returns a quotient and a remainder in such a way that this formula will hold. So a, the number that we are dividing, can be reconstructed by multiplying the quotient by b, which is the number we divided by, and then adding on the remainder. And the remainder needs to be in this range for this to be valid. And with that, I wish you much fun, and I'll see you in the next video.